Good morning. I'm Rob Quinn, the Executive Director of Scholars at Risk. And it's my honor to welcome you to the Scholars at Risk 2020 Global Network Congress. Even in normal times, our work at Scholars at Risk, our network, which all of you are a part of, is about resilience. We exist to assist colleagues overcome pressures and threats. We exist to document attacks on higher education communities. And we exist to preserve and promote the values of that higher education space, values that are not only important to higher education, but to everyone in society. The resilience at the heart of our network is on display now as we gather together for the first time in this virtual Congress format. So as we begin, I wanna thank and congratulate all of you for showing your resilience, your perseverance, and your commitment to our colleagues, to our work, to our network, and to our values. By being here today and joining in the various sessions of the virtual Congress, you're making a statement. What was important before is still important. What we needed and wanted in our communities yesterday is what we need and want in our communities today and what we will still need and want in our communities tomorrow. This year's Congress, which also marks the 20th year of Scholars at Risk service to the higher education community, brings together SAR members and partners around the world to explore the theme, truth, power, and society. The promise of higher education in challenging times. I think this theme is spot on. In times of historic challenges, not only to higher education, but to society, truth itself is under attack. The theme recognizes this and points to three core roles of higher education in response to these attacks. Truth in the form of research and teaching leading to new insights and understanding. Power, in the form of evidence-based contributions to public discourse and policy. And society, in the form of meaningful engagement with the broadest public good. How we, scholars, students, leaders, and the public, understand these roles goes to the heart of increasing pressures on higher education around the world from infringements on autonomy to violent protests, to wrongful prosecutions and imprisonments and more. With the onset of the novel coronavirus, these concerns are supercharged. Professional researchers and scholars inside and outside of higher education and across all disciplines are playing a vital role in responding to the epidemiological, economic, political and cultural dimensions of this crisis, as they will in the eventual recovery and restoration of essential functions and services of our institutions and societies. At the same time, deliberate interference with the dissemination of data and intentional or negligent distortion of information delivered to the public and policymakers alike appear to have contributed to delayed and disorderly responses to this emergency. How do we guard against these? How do we defend scientific integrity and academic freedom? How do we understand the space of higher education when our campuses have gone virtual? And what are the values we carry with us into these virtual spaces? Over the next two days, the Congress will serve as a forum to discuss these and other important questions. It will be a chance to reconnect with each other will be a chance to develop practices for navigating the unique challenges of today and to create opportunities to continue our work together, protecting threatened scholars, promoting academic freedom, and defending everyone's freedom to think, question, and share ideas. I look forward to sharing these next two days with you and congratulate you for making it. Thank you for being a part of this and everything that we do. Now, a few housekeeping points. During each of the panel sessions, audience members are invited to submit questions for our speakers. To submit a question, you'll need to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you have privacy concerns, please use the anonymous feature or private feature to submit your question. 
And due to the compressed schedule of the Congress, please forgive us if we can't get to every question. We also encourage you all to contribute to the social media conversation that will be taking place in parallel to the Congress sessions. Share your favorite quotes and ideas and questions over Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, but make sure to tag at scholars at risk and use the hashtag, hashtag SAR Congress 2020. The schedule for the Congress is roughly four hours today and four hours tomorrow, all in the same room. So feel free to stay throughout or come in and go out as your schedule permits. And for those who are unable to attend a particular session, do not worry. We are recording the Congress. We'll make sessions available for later review. We would invite your help in sharing those links with others who aren't with us at the moment to broaden the reach of our conversation. Finally, I want to acknowledge again that as much as we're enjoying this new challenge of a virtual Congress format, and as much as getting together in this way is better than not getting together at all, we still know it's not as good as getting together in person. Over the coming weeks, we'll be exploring the possibility of rescheduling some of the in-person elements of the Congress for later in the year. For now, I would ask you to mark your calendars for November 16th to 20th 2020 in New York City with more information to follow. So with that aside, I'd like to kick off our virtual Congress by introducing our first session of the day, Academic Freedom in the MENA Region, which will examine diverse threats to higher education communities in the Middle East and North Africa. The moderator for this session is Dr. Lisa Anderson. Lisa is American political scientist, Professor Emerita International Relations at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, and the former president of the American University of Cairo. She's also a friend and a valued member of the Scholars of this Board. Thank you, thank you, Lisa, for joining us and leading this session. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, I'm delighted to be participating in this experiment um, and want to welcome everyone who is participating. Um, we're all a little bit new at this, so bear with us as we get our bearings in this new environment. Um, but I think it's an exciting opportunity for us to share the kinds of experiences and advice and thoughts that we would have had were we together in person. Obviously, we're starting today's program with a discussion of academic freedom in the Middle East and North Africa. This is, as you all know, one of the most fraught regions in the world. The Middle East has seen challenges to academic freedom from almost every conceivable direction. Civil rest and war, economic deprivation, government skepticism, if not outright hostility. It is a difficult context. And yet, if we learn nothing else from the battle against the coronavirus today, we need scientific research, we need evidence-based policymaking, and we need transparent communication more than ever in this interconnected era. There are a lot of excuses for discouraging research. There are national security imperatives and industrial secrets and intellectual property. And to inhibiting what can be taught, we certainly don't want to poison the minds of our young people. But efforts to block or limit the free flow of ideas are ultimately a fool's errand. Ideas travel like viruses, and we need to give the good ones opportunities to crowd out the bad. That is true in the Middle East as much as it is anywhere in the world. So with that, let me introduce our speakers for today. The program has them give us a few remarks and observations, and we will then have a conversation among the three of us and then open the floor to questions from those of you who are participating. We're very fortunate to have two really distinguished individuals with us this morning, and it is morning here in New York. Dr. Halad Dosari is a Saudi Arabian scholar of health services, a very useful discipline these days, and she is a women's rights activist. She's been affiliated with Johns Hopkins and Harvard and is currently the uh, Wilhelm Fellow at MIT's Center for International Studies. She has served as a columnist for the Washington Post and engages regularly in research and advocacy, particularly on women's rights in Saudi Arabia and the Arab Gulf states. 
and she's been widely recognized for her work in women's and human rights. Having received Human Rights Watch Alison DeForge Award in 2018 and the Freedom Award from Freedom House in 2016. David Wheeler is the founding editor of Alfenar Media. For seven years, Alfenar Media has covered higher education research and arts and cultures in the 22 countries of the Arab world. Uh, Alfenar Media is published entirely in both English and Arabic. Before Alfenar Media, David was the managing editor of the Chronicle of Higher Education. David, let me start with you, if I may. A recent survey that was published in Alfenar revealed that most academics in the Arab region preferred to leave the region and pursue their work elsewhere. This was a stunning finding. Can you talk a little bit about the potential issues underlying this sentiment? How often did academic freedom figure in the rationales or it, the way the academics who responded that way thought about their own careers? I'm sure, <clears throat> Lisa, thank you and thanks for, um, for everyone for attending. Uh, I'm going to provide, before I get to the details of the survey, I'm going to try to provide a little broader context um, for the session. Uh, from my perspective, the unfortunate headline for the session is that academic freedom is diminishing dramatically across the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and it's shrinking in the larger context of really diminishing freedom of expression and tighter regulation of social media. Um, and the restriction on freedom of expression is taking place even in countries that used to have pretty relaxed controls on speech, such as Kuwait and Lebanon. <clears throat> um, after the Arab Spring, really authorities in many Arab countries realized that they, sh that although they had been able to shut down street protests in the past, they needed to do, to do the same for social media, which had largely been a free-for-all for intellectuals and journalists in 2011-2012. And, and libel and defamation laws have also become a tool of states in silencing criticism. Uh, in many Gulf countries, libel is a criminal, not a civil offense, and the truth is not always a defense. Meaning saying something critical about a person or an organization can land someone in jail, even if what that critic says is true. And likewise, in Lebanon, um, antiquated defamation laws that are also criminal, not civil in nature, have been used in recent years to shut down journalists and academics trying to point out state corruption, uh, a Human Rights Watch report concluded. Often our media itself reported a year ago about Egypt's closing of many bookstores and community libraries, the imprisonment of a publisher, the severe censorship of many publishing houses, uh, in 2018, we published a commentary by an instructor at a Kuwaiti private college who said that Kuwait had banned 4,390 books in five years or more than 800 books a year. And then just last month, we reported about the arrest of Patrick George Zaki, a young Egyptian human rights scholar interested in women's rights and working towards a master's degree in Italy. Uh, he worked at the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights, one of the few human rights organizations still operating in Egypt. And Scholars at Risk Network's own Free to Think 2019 report is an important compendium of violations against academia. Uh, that includes examples in Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Turkey, and Israel's restrictions on foreign scholars working in the West Bank. I mean, the report rightly highlighted Sudan as well it should have since the Sudanese government uh, took the extraordinary step of closing all Sudanese universities about a year ago in an attempt to silence anti-government protests. I mean, in the wake of that, uh, and this past fall, some of our reporters have talked to Sudanese academics who say that now that the universities are open again, the situation has improved. And they're saying that there is less uh, central government control of universities now than there was uh, before the revolution. Um, that's probably perhaps one of the few positive signs in the region in terms of academic freedom if, if it turns out to be confirmed and, and to continue. And then just this last December, <coughs> often I did the survey that you referenced. Uh, it was a survey of researchers working in the Arab region uh, the survey's results did, in fact, have a very surprising twist involving academic freedom. 
Um, so the survey was completed by 650 researchers from a broad geographic spread of the 22 Arab countries. Um, the original goal actually wasn't to look, uh, investigate academic freedom, but to look at the obstacles that Arab researchers face in the hope of basically informing policymakers and donors about how they, they could assist researchers. And as you, as you mentioned, the, the major and somewhat stunning conclusion was that 91% of the researchers surveyed wanted to leave the country they were working in. And that's obviously not a good indicator for those Arab countries that want local talent to tackle regional problems or give advice. But what our editors found was that improving academic freedom would be one way that could help Arab countries to hold on to their researchers. Uh, so the first question in the survey was, what are the obstacles to good research? And we had a drop down list of nine factors that included academic freedom. Uh, in responses to this question, actually, uh, academic freedom only ranked eighth among the nine factors that the people surveyed felt were barriers to research. But then in another question, we asked the respondents what made them want to move and give, gave them a list of six factors that included factors such as more opportunity to advance in their discipline and escaping corruption and bureaucracy. And there actually 43% of those surveyed said that academic freedom was one of the factors or poor academic freedom, I'm guessing, was one of, one of the factors that made them want to move. It actually ranked as a higher factor than their own salary. So put another way, they cared more about ac academic freedom than about what they got paid. Uh, and in comment boxes in the survey and also in separate interviews we conducted alongside the survey, we found that among students who wanna earn master's degrees and doctorates, they did feel they had to be very careful about choosing a research topic for their thesis to avoid getting into political or legal trouble. Um, this is not a big surprise given that there have been some well publicized, well publicized cases of students working on advanced degrees getting jailed or in one instance um, killed. I believe the follow on risk of growing censorship and diminishing academic freedom is that more and more academics will censor themselves and be fearful about taking the risks of strong social research and expressing critical thought. And in these difficult times globally, we are learning about the importance of academic experts speaking truth to power. Uh, even in the tightly controlled of China, tightly controlled society of China, I found it interesting that there appeared to be a groundswell of public support for those doctors and public health experts who stood up to government's deceptions in the early days of the coronavirus pandemic. I'm hoping we can cultivate the same sort of broad public appreciation for the importance of academic freedom in the Arab region. And that's the end of my comments. Well, thank you, David. That's a, um, a great tour of the issues in the region. Um, not particularly um, heartening, but probably candid. Hala, let me turn to you. Does this description resonate with you as an academic who has worked in the region? What have you found are the biggest impediments to pursuing an academic career? Um, thank you, uh, Lisa. Yes, definitely it, it resonates a lot. And I feel like most of those uh, remarks and ideas have actually um, either happened to me myself as a scholar or happened to people uh, in academia in general, um, people that I'm acquainted with or uh, I've crossed paths with. Um, so I might give you some notes on um, some of the experience I've found in, the, um, in academia. And of course, the strong influence of academics in general on improving policy or engaging uh, the public in general in uh, exchange of ideas or information which is one of the most uh, sensitive and one of the most uh, uh, functions of academia um, that is uh, impacted uh, under the current regimes. Um, so over the last two decades, uh, several Arab countries have actually tried to reform their educational institutions. Um, they focus so much on science, engineering, and medicine, rather than on humanities, on public administration, or um, on arts in general. And because of that, um, we've seen um, like a new cohorts of people in academia. Uh, there were scholarship programs, there were uh, change in the uh, standards of universities. Uh, and one of those standards uh, 
basically is to improve uh, the transparency and the ability of the university to conduct research freely. So that in, in certain discipline has, has been improved, uh, but not definitely in, in uh, critical, sorry, uh, not in uh, institutions where, uh, for instance, we need more um, opinion and we need more information. Um, so we didn't see that across all disciplines in academia. Uh, most of the targeted political prisoners since the last two decades were coming from academic institutions where people who, because of this kind of uh, function and activity, have engaged in um, campaigning or writings to advocate for reforms. Uh, in the United Arab Emirates, for instance, uh, several prominent professors were rounded up and jailed, handed very lengthy uh, prison uh, terms for petitioning the state for reforms. They include Dr. Muhammad al -Rukn. He himself has been one of the most vocal advocates for legal reform and was the head of the uh, legal association in, in his country. Uh, similarly, in Saudi Arabia, uh, professors who demanded constitutional reforms uh, were treated uh, the same way, handed 15, uh, 10 to 15 uh, years of imprisonment. Uh, women professors were rounded up in uh, 2018 for engaging with other activists to demand uh, certain gender reforms. They include Dr. Hatoun El Fasi, uh, who's a historian uh, and a writer, uh, Iman Al Nafjan, who's a linguistic professor, Aziz Al Youssef, a retired lecturer, and Abir Namankani, who's a science professor. All of these women, um, some of these women were later released, uh, pending trial. But of course, they were, um, uh, they remain under travel bans. They're unable to go back to their jobs. So basically, uh, their ability to function as before has been, uh, has come to a halt. Um, the, there are three other professors who conducted research on women movement. And this has been something that is really strange for me. So we had uh, three other women. Uh, who conducted the research on the women movement in Saudi Arabia, and they were um, actually funded uh, for that research uh, by um, a, U a U.S. based uh, organization. They came to the U.S., the research was in English, uh, they presented their work, uh, but during the roundup in 2018, they were asked specifically on, uh, on that type of presentation and how did they do their work. They had to conduct the U.S. Uh, an institution to basically take down the talk and take down their research from the website. So it's inaccessible now. Um, though most of the things that they've reported on uh, were public things and were public knowledge. It, it wasn't something that is uh, particularly uh, problematic. Um, so we've seen um, uh, these conditions uh, exacerbated recently and uh, not only because of the mass revolutions that, that swept the Arab countries, but also because of a rise of militant leaders, uh, autocratic leaders, um, who are uh, more insecure uh, during this kind of transition, and they resort more often to uh, repressive uh, measures. Uh, the influence of the state in Saudi Arabia in particular on academia has been largely increased because of uh, the rise of Mohammed bin Salman, uh, the attempt of the state to control the public message or the narrative. Um, so they've actually started, um, despite the fact that we had thousands of students who have been studying uh, abroad um, since 2005, actually. They were mainly studying in the US and Canada. Uh, and of course, as I said, the programs were mainly uh, offered, uh, the scholarship programs were offered only to certain disciplines, the science, the engineering, the medicine, the law, with a small number of, st of students studying arts and humanities. So during the, the scholarship programs, there was often reports on students being surveyed for what they write on uh, their social media accounts, uh, how do they engage with their own uh, groups uh, in the university. Uh, this has been, the monitoring has been done by the Cultural Attaché Office and through a student club that is initiated by and funded by uh, the Saudi government. Um, so some of the students, because of their writings, because of their critical um, uh, views on everything related to the, to the society in general, even if uh, they were critical of the performance of the, of the Cultural Attaché itself, um, so the, their scholarships uh, were terminated. Uh, so also, some of these students felt like they had to limit their engagement uh, with figures which could be critical of the state. So for instance, if a public talk is being uh, held, something like this, for instance, like what we're having, uh, they felt like they would be uh, guilty, found guilty by association. So even access, they have been uh, developing the self-censorship, which is a side effect of being uh, monitored, of being expected to function and, and uh, study in certain way. Uh, 
Uh, myself, I was a scholar uh, on the scholarship program uh, here in the US. Um, and because of my writings, uh, some other students recommended that I give a talk to uh, the heads of the students club, the Saudi students club uh, in their annual meetings in DC. But they requested to see the talk before I uh, present it in person. Uh, the person who was responsible for reviewing my talk was very upset because uh, of some of the remarks I've mentioned. And she, did, she sent me a note that, you know, the whole uh, meeting was canceled. Of course, it wasn't canceled, but my own talks was canceled. Uh, so it just, um, one of the strange things that we've witnessed is how even the um, little critical notes are unacceptable. Um, also, the, some other students uh, continually call me, and whenever they call me to, you know, to revise their work or give consultation on their dissertation or thesis, they try to find ways to escape the censorship of the cultural touch in different places in the, in the UK, in Canada. And you know the meeting is very much like um, you could you could sense the self censorship uh, at the people talking to me. Um, they're not happy with um, with the title that they sent to the attaché, and they had to change, for instance, the word "removing the guardianship" into something more neutral. So hiding basically uh, behind words or behind different techniques in order to pass their own research or uh, get the funding for their own research. Needless to say, even finding people now to, to survey or to give opinions is very difficult uh, with, from within Saudi Arabia. People are so hesitant to speak about issues which are considered controversial, which more or less everything related to society in Saudi Arabia. Because they, you know, they can find ways to, um, to silence people and um, you know, people somehow learn. They, they become more uh, self-censoring themselves. Uh, one, and of course, the, the result of that is that only foreign researchers are able to research uh, from within. And of course, sometimes it comes with a great personal risk, uh, like what, what happens, for instance, uh, for several uh, British or Italian researchers in the region. Uh, the only, for instance, um, notable uh, meeting for researchers to publish their work at the Gulf Research Meeting is only um, you know, a, a forum for foreign uh, researchers. There was one, there, there used to be one or two people uh, who submitted research, but because they can't go back to the region to conduct or follow up the research, um, or they feel like uh, this is a, a, fun, a state funded uh, meeting. So they feel like uh, this is not something that they can safely engage with. Uh, the result is that most of those who are studying the Gulf, who are writing about the Gulf, are based in the Western sphere and not in, the, in those communities. Um, so the one thing I wanted to talk about um, is also the effect of political system on um, the students who are outside. Um, I don't know if uh, the audience are aware of this, but after the Canadian foreign minister tweeted um, something in support of the release of some of the women activists, uh, that was back in 2018, so the, Sa the Saudi regime decided to sever the diplomatic relation and you know, uh, ask all the students, the Saudi students, who have spent a lot of time finishing their degrees there, to relocate to a different country. That was extremely difficult for physicians. It took a lot of effort to convince the Saudi government not to relocate the, phys the physicians. You know, the um, uh, physician board there had to write a letter to explain why it's com completely difficult to pull people out of their residency because the training position are simply not available uh, by demand or on demand. Um, I still remember one of the interviews I had uh, for a professor job when I finished my PhD here in the US. I was uh, you know, given an inter in the interview some tips on how to avoid any public engagement. So the two deans uh, who were, uh, you know, both are female, it was one of the, it's actually the largest women university in the Middle East. Uh, the two female deans decided that I might be problematic on their own, of course, there wasn't any written um, notes or anything. So they decided to advise me if I want to continue working in academia is to basically uh, curtail all my activity, all my public engagement or advocacy. Uh, and this again, uh, because they felt like if they hired me, uh, regardless of the need, regardless of your merits or qualification, they might be found again guilty by association. Uh, international universities have also been uh, part of the regional uh, educational uh, you know, um, 
and institutions. So we have branches um, for different, um, you know, uh, university campuses in Qatar, in the UAE, in um, uh, in Lebanon and, and Egypt. But their impact on the academic environment in general have been questionable. So they do produce quality information, but they're not as engaged with their community as with the, you know, I haven't seen actually any of the professors uh, from those universities who are engaging uh, with the public, uh, which tells you that they actually um, function when, when under the same conditions as the local universities. It's like a small enclave of the Western, you know, um, places, but not functioning according to the, to the standards in, in, any, in any other Western uh, university. Uh, the example is Lujain al hadlul She's one of the most prominent women activists. She was actually abducted from the UAE while pursuing her graduate education in uh, Sorbonne uh, University, in a, a chapter of the so Sorbonne University. Um, the Sorbonne University never said anything about her and two other siblings who were banned from travel. All her family is, is banned. She remained in prison. Uh, but the, the Sorbonne University didn't appeal uh, for her release, though they are not technically under the conditions of uh, the other university. But British Columbia, uh, the university in which uh, she finished her undergrad, has actually published a letter of support. Uh, similarly, uh, MISA or the Middle East uh, you know, um, Studies Association has published a letter to demand the release of another woman historian or a professor, Dr. Hatun El Fasi. And just tell us uh, how much the impact of uh, the, repute, the reputable academic institutions could have on uh, providing legitimacy for the leader. Uh, let's go back and remember that uh, at the beginning of MBS um, role as a crown prince, uh, he did a visit um, MIT and Harvard in a photo op, basically, and uh, everyone was taking picture, and it was largely promoted because his his own vision is very much founded on appeal to youth. Uh, so having you know pictures with the heads of Harvard and MIT, and seeing the institutions has been very strong message has sent a very strong message to uh, the constituencies. Um, we have to remember as well that this has created this kind of controversy. A lot of people felt like universities shouldn't be giving legitimacy to leaders who, with questionable, uh, you know, uh, reputation. Uh, so I, I, I met actually with MIT um, uh, Vice President um, uh, Rafael Reif at the beginning of uh, uh, my, uh, my fellowship here at, at MIT. And he explained that they had formed the committee after the killing of Jamal Khashoggi to uh, basically look into the ties of the university with the um, Saudi um, either funds or the Saudi people. And uh, I asked him if he would make um, this letter, uh, the letter that condemns the murder that actually in, 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 encourages countries to uh, adopt more, um, you know, uh, tolerant uh, views to, to criticism, uh, if he would translate that letter into Arabic. And he said, this is a good idea, but the letter has never been translated. So we only see the, ob the photo ops, basically, but we don't see any kinds of for the Arabic people, they don't really see uh, a strong position from those uh, institutions when it comes to uh, you know, freedom of expression. Uh, it's not only the, the universities, also the think tanks. So you have think tanks that are heavily, which actually organizes the thinking. The think tanks in DC and elsewhere are also influenced or directly by the funds that come from uh, different states, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, and they control not only uh, the funding, but also who is researched and why and what is the topic of the research. Um, so in short, I, I feel like um, the, the three values mentioned by Rob is very much at a stake when you think about power, when you think about truth, when you think about um, the society are very much not represented properly in, when you come to um, academia. Because I think the legitimacy of the ruler is done by controlling the public access to information, what kind of messages are out there. And this is at the heart of um, you know, authoritarian regimes. Um, so academic research, writing and publication has been in general in the region uh, as one of the lowest, uh, the, uh, in, in the region in general, as um, uh, David has mentioned, has one of the lowest uh, production of, um, of research and publication with, with very few exceptions. Thank you, that was really, um... A, a remarkable um, compendium of the kinds of things 
um, I was actually going to ask you about particularly, and I think if we had all day, we would pursue some discussions about what it is that um, European and American and Canadian institutions can do to support the, our colleagues in the region. Um, I think, you know, from the perspective of scholars at risk, the fact that there is a network of universities who are committed, at least um, to some degree, to supporting and hosting academics is an important first step. But you're right, um, there's much more that the global international academic community could be doing to support people um, and to helping them stay where they're working if they want to. So some of what David has shown us um, in terms of the general data you have illustrated in um, uh, chilling detail, really. David, before we turn to um, the open questions, which I we will do shortly, um, I just wondered whether you had any um, sense that what Hal is describing, which is pretty much Gulf focused, is also true elsewhere in the region? Are there variations? Are there different things we should be thinking about if we're thinking about Egypt or Algeria or Syria? Um, I guess what I, I, what I personally found most interesting in terms of Hala's remarks was really the control of speech outside of the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and I wasn't that surprised um, in terms of Saudi monitoring of students outside the region. I have not heard of similar monitoring by other Arab countries. On the other hand, if something that a student said really rose, um, you know, was kind of heard in the media, I suspect that it would have repercussions at home if it's just being done in a small student club in a university and doesn't go beyond that. I don't think there would be repercussions for that student or, um, or professor. Um, so that was my, um, you know, some of my uh, uh, response to what, you know, to what she had, had to say. You need to unmute. I'm telling you, it's going to take us a while to get used to this. Um, uh, you're right, though. I can attest, actually, to um, that kind of experience, having taught um, since I've returned from Egypt a number of courses at Columbia that have a lot of international students in them. And virtually everyone from the region is concerned about the fact that someone from the mission knows what they're doing or why are they taking a course that's called, as a course I teach, is called authoritarianism. Um, why would anybody need to take that course? What's interesting about that? Can we see the syllabus and so forth? So I actually think what she's describing is something that we as an academic community outside the region ought to be spending far more time and attention on. Um, so this is not, um, you know, th again, w this is something we should be thinking about as the network that supports scholars more broadly. Um, before I turn it to open questions, I understand there are a few and I will have to see if I can find them. Um, are, there, are there any bright spots in the region? Are there any opportunities that seem to be coming to the fore? Um, what are the kinds of things we ought to be encouraging if there is anything to encourage? Maybe, Hala, you could take that first. Yeah, I think there are, of course. There are a lot of researchers, but um, a lot of uh, professors. Uh, and I think the scholarship program has produced just, um, you see more Saudis outside because we are the largest uh, in number when it comes to people on, on the scholarship. Uh, but yes, as, as I said, those people are an actual um, basically um, asset, the, the, the education of those kinds of cohort, uh, women and men uh, who came back to, some of them came back to their countries and some of them decided to stay like myself and others have decided to stay outside for safety. Uh, but I, th I, th I see those people organizing outside, trying to publish something uh, and I see their voices are being more included when it comes to research on the region, even when they're out outside. So for instance, someone um, who wants, who is a, who's a, a Western uh, scholar, uh, wants to write a book on civil society. 
if she can partner with um, someone who's already an authority on the on the subject, but um, because of, of security concerns, uh, that person is outside. I think that's an asset, and it will it will add a lot rather than uh, because yes, they can't go back to to do an actual research or field work, but they can inform. And this is something that I've been doing a lot lately. So many people who are researching in the region are actually uh, contacting me uh, just to give the context or. Uh, give more uh, representation to the to the to the whole thing. Um, so I feel, yeah, there are opportunities, and there there is more recognition of the need to. Unfortunately, what's happening in the region is that the governments, because they can't really rely on their own um, experts from academia, they do tend to get experts from abroad, and they they come and provide you with a set of you know tools uh, to reform or to to initiate certain uh, policies without the uh, knowledge, the inherent knowledge of the society uh, at hand. And their in engagement with the governments are very much like intermittent and it's not continuous. So you get to see this kind of, I think there was a, a paper on foreign policy on the whole, th on the foreign affairs, sorry, on the role of consultants and the reforms uh, basically in the, uh, in the region. Uh, so I see the, the people themselves are the actual assets rather than the institutions which are very much influenced by the authoritarianism. Great, great, thanks very much. I have a couple of questions from the audience, and I, so I'd like to, we have discussed, there was a, there is a set of questions actually on what people located outside the Western scholars can do and so forth. And I think we've talked about that a little bit. Um, I think there's also implicit in that question, I guess, um, perhaps David, you can take this. Um, does it make more sense, or either one of you, but does it make more sense for, the academic community outside the region to basically tell students um, not to refrain from doing research in the region, that it's too dangerous, that it's too, um, uh, you know, that essentially to boycott regimes where there is not, you know, open research and so forth and so on. Is that a better approach? Um, or is it better to try and do kinds of engagement even in the face of um, what are clearly going to be limitations and conceivably dangers. Um, David, do you have a sense of how people in the region think about that? Um, I, well, I guess my own response to that would be, I would really hate to discourage research. And I think there is ways of doing it, um, even if it's, uh, you know, remotely. Um, when you were asking about highlights, you know, was there any positive um, spots in the region? I was gonna mention a, one that people wouldn't expect. I have heard from multiple academics in Syria that because the government is so distracted with other issues, they're a little less interested in micromanaging what's happening in the classroom or the discussions there. And particularly in, um, in private universities where the, where the syllabus is in English and not in Arabic, there's less control of the syllabus. Um, and I see Syrians themselves trying to do research remotely, uh, including you know, medical research, public health research. And I, I think that they, deserve, they essentially deserve support and mentoring. And I do see opportunities for Western institutions to be engaged um, there. And if certainly if it can be done in Syria, it could be done in other institutions. Obviously a lot of caution um, needs to be exercised, um, but, but I think more, not less engagement would really be, be the way to go. I'd hate to see people just stopping, stopping doing research. Hello. I think it depends on the type of research. Um, as, as Rob mentioned, I think there are certain areas which are not directly under the, um, basically the control of the state. Um, but strangely enough, there are more and more areas now that have, it, it, we, we considered women's rights as, as something that is very neutral, that is something that doesn't necessarily clash with the, with the views of the government when it comes to reform. But uh, of course it's not. It just seemed like any kinds of mobilization on the ground is problematic. Any kinds of research, as I've mentioned, the research of the three professors uh, that had to be taken down, it's just something that is uh, unexplained. But I do agree that there is a person at risk. There is a lot of um, complacent, basically, um, attitude when it, when it comes to, to tolerate, uh, you know, the behavior of those regimes. 
and for that reason it's very difficult to get people out if they if they fail into, into any if they f fall into trouble it might be very difficult to get them out of the of the region so yes uh, depends on the type of research it depends on um, where you're doing the research there are certain countries especially the gulf countries which are very much shielded uh, by by certain you know um, uh, power elites um, and it's very difficult to get people out once they're in so um, and one of the things that I've heard from uh, researchers, foreign researchers, of course, uh, is that for them to conduct research by meeting uh, natives from within those countries, um, they expect that at a certain point before publishing those things, they have to leave the country. So they cannot really publish while still expecting to come back to the country and you know, further their research or advance their research. So the minute they publish their opinions or their, their writings, they, they know that th that's the end. They cannot really go back. I have one quick question. We're having, we're going to wrap up quickly, but I think this is, it is sort of a puzzle and it's something, Hala, you raised, but again, David, you probably have a region-wide perspective on this. We in the West, in any event, tend to think of the humanities as pretty benign, that the kinds of things one has to worry about may be you know, social science research that's offensive to a government or even STEM research that's about intellectual property. But why is it that humanities research, the kind of work that's done, um, you know, by historians and linguists and so forth and so on, why is that an issue for anyone? How you're the one that pointed out. That well, basically, I think because, again, uh, there is a certain message, public message that is sent to the, to the public in order to control the narrative. Uh, there is one thing that people should know about their leader, um, their history, um, their relationships. So anything that would challenge this kind of narrative, anything that would add different, not necessarily um, co conflict uh, than, you know, with the narrative that, that the government is pushing, but also provide an alternative narrative. So I think it's more or less about controlling what the public know about the, the, the state, uh, just like a domain that has to be uh, controlled totally because of the legitimacy of the regime. Um, the, I think uh, with, the, with the transition, and not only because of the authoritarianism, but because of the inability of the system uh, to function uh, the same way as before, uh, you know, being able to send the message about the state, about the reform, about what's needed is very important. And this is why the humanity might not be you know, the best uh, research out there or, or um, discipline out there. David, do you have any comments on that or last words? We're, as I say, having to wrap up soon. I would just uh, say that, yes, the humanities and social sciences kind of risk being critical of the very fabric of society. You know, the historical okay. narrative of, behind a government, you know, cultural relations among people, um, you know, and although they may be viewed as being more benign in other countries, they're, they're really viewed as being at risk of, of attacking the fabric of Arab culture in some in some countries, regrettably. Well, I'm sorry to say we are being instructed to wrap up. Um, I would love to spend the entire day with both of you, and there are several um, questions that are we don't have time to answer, including I must say some questions from people who are friends and colleagues, and I particularly regret not being able to um, acknowledge them. But I want to thank both Dr. Halal Dosari and David Wheeler for your remarkable insight and willingness to join us um, in this conversation on academic freedom in the region. Um, I'd like to suggest that university personnel on the call consider reaching out to SAR and to our partners, the Scholar Rescue Fund, CARA, and PAUSE in Europe about hosting scholars and otherwise supporting the scholarship that's being done in the region, um, thinking about regional monitoring and advocacy efforts. Um, so once again, thank you both and thank you all who have participated. The next session is a panel on responses to the crisis in Turkey. So we're not leaving the region really. And it'll be starting in a few minutes at about 1030. So once again, thank you all. Um, and I look forward to continuing these conversations. <laughs>